Brookfield Corporation just released their most recent quarterly earnings. So what we're going to do today is provide a brief overview of Brookfield Corporation's different business segments. We're going to be looking at those most recent quarterly earnings in detail. We'll have a look at their value of the capital or assets of the corporation. And then finally, we're going to look at a few words shared by their CEO, Bruce Flat. So if that's some content you would be interested in listening to, I encourage you to watch the video. And if you like it, give it a thumbs up. So without further ado, let's go and dive right into the video. Now, I've made various videos on Brookfield Corporation and Brookfield Asset Management. So again, if you've been following my channel for a while, you should be familiar with a lot of this. And if you have, I encourage you to skip ahead right to the earnings report. I'll leave the timestamps in the description below. But a lot of new people have joined my channel in the past. So I think it's valuable to go over this information again. And some other people who have been watching for a while might actually benefit from listening to it again. So we're going to be starting at the beginning in terms of Brookfield Corporation. So what does Brookfield Corporation do? They are an alternative investment or an alternative asset manager. So what is an alternative investment or an alternative asset? It is a financial asset that does not fall into one of the conventional or standard investment categories. So the conventional or standard investment categories here, practically speaking to any stocks or bonds. So Anything that is really not a stock or a bond could be classified as an alternative investment. So here depicted is a nice classical bottle of wine. It's very aged. It's aged nicely and it grows higher and higher in value as the years pass. You have an antique vase or an antique pocket watch and possibly a nice painting here. I'm not really sure what that is. But again, these are alternative investments. They have monetary value that gains over time or grows higher in value over time but they are not conventional or standard investments like stocks or bonds. All right, so we're gonna be looking at Brookfield Corporation. Now, like I said, they're an alternative asset manager, but it is a pretty complex structure that they operate into. So I'm gonna to try to break it down as best as I can. And any comments or questions, please leave those in the comments and questions section below, and I will do my best to get to them. But here is the entire Brookfield Corporation. Now, the best way to look at it is Brookfield Corporation is like the parent and then all of these different businesses here. These are all the children. So Brookfield Corporation has specific percentage stakes in all of these businesses. And we're going to go through each of these businesses as well. So Brookfield Corporation has a 75% stake in Brookfield Asset Management, a 27% stake in Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, a 48% stake in Brookfield Renewable Partners, 65% in 65% stake, sorry, in Brookfield Business Partners, 100% stake in Brookfield Property Group, and 100% stake in the Brookfield Reinsurance or Insurance Business. So a lot of these are publicly traded, such as Brookfield Asset Management, the ticker symbol is BAM, Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, ticker symbol here is BIP, Brookfield Renewable Partners, I believe the ticker symbol here is BNU, uh, Brookfield Business Partners, that's BBU, and then Brookfield Property Partners here. This is private, so you cannot buy this security. It is held privately by the corporation in its whole or entirely by the corporation and Brookfield Reinsurance BNRE. So these businesses right here, the infrastructure, renewables, business partners, and property group are known as their operating businesses. The Brookfield Reinsurance operates in the insurance industry on a float and the Brookfield Asset Management uh, business operates based on assets under management and it collects fees based on those. So let's look at the operating businesses first. So Brookfield Infrastructure Partners. This, this business essentially builds everything related to infrastructure. So that's kind of the backbone of the economy. You got data centers, uh, specific hydro towers. You have, you know, dams. You can have like all of these specific infrastructure businesses or specific infrastructure needs for cities and the economy. Brookfield Infrastructure Partners is in that specific business. Brookfield Renewable Partners, now this is focusing on renewable energy. So again, decarbonization, focusing on solar, wind power, etc. That is in the renewable sector. Brookfield Business Partners, this is their private credit business here. Brookfield Property Group, so just as the name suggests, they are focused on prime real estate or what they call trophy real estate. Now, the Brookfield reinsurance business, this is fairly new, but it is scaling up significantly and I think is going to be a huge, huge growth factor or in their trajectory moving forward. 
So again, Brookfield Reinsurance, they issue insurance product, uh, products or they write insurance policies and then they get the funds from those and they invest that float. Now, the crown jewel here, like I've said many times on my channel, is Brookfield Asset Management. So Brookfield Asset Management here, what it does is it collects funds from investors such as sovereign wealth funds, institutions, pension plans, even large private investors. They take that money and then they invest that into their various businesses and they earn a percentage as a fee for managing those assets. So that is what the Brookfield Asset Management business does. And in my opinion, it is the crown jewel of the Brookfield Corporation. So that's the overview of the Brookfield Corporation. Now let's go and look at the specific ways that value is created, the key performance metrics and how value is measured. But first I wanna look at this little blurb they have here about the Brookfield Corporation. So the corporation's goal is to compound capital over the long term. So again, here, think in terms of decades. So as to earn an annualized return of 15% plus for their shareholders or stakeholders. So again, they're communicating here to us investors that they want to get a 15% plus return for us shareholders or investors. And they've done this over the past 30 years. So again, uh, it's great, great communication here from Brookfield Corporation, that being their primary goal. So in order to achieve this, they have a disciplined investment approach, uh, leveraging their 100 plus year history as an owner and operator of real assets. They create value, deliver strong risk adjusted returns across market cycles. So today their capital is invested across three businesses or those three business segments like we saw, the asset management business, insurance solutions, and those four core operating businesses, which generate approximately $5 billion of free cash flow annually, all of which is underpinned by what they call a conservatively capitalized balance sheet. And again, that referring to how their balance sheet is basically structured in terms of debt, but while that debt being non-course or most or most of it recourse. But again, we'll look at that when we look at the shareholder letter. So DE, also known as distributable earnings, represents the deconsolidated earnings of the corporation that are available for distribution to shareholders and it's their primary performance metric. So again, this is super important. Brookfield Corporation letting us know that DE or distributable earnings to shareholders is what they consider to be their primary performance metric and what they intend to build on for the future. So DE is composed of distributions they receive from their asset management, insurance solutions, and operating businesses. It also includes disposition gains on principal investments. So again, that's when they buy specific assets that they think are undervalued, they put some money into it or they fix them up and then they recycle those assets, getting specific gains on those sales. And they also have their share of realized carried interest that is earned by their asset management business. So I've talked about this a lot on my channel too, but realized carried interest, specifically in their asset management business, when they invest uh, funds for specific investors, again, built into those contracts, they actually get a percentage of those returns and they call that carried interest. So it's their share of those returns. And again, this is a huge, huge growth factor in my opinion for the future. A lot of people I think are discounting this realized carried interest. This is straight cash flow and income that's gonna flow to Brookfield Corporation. So they target, they're growing their DE by 15% or more each year, again, in line with what they think that annualized return should be for shareholders. So they create value for shareholders in two ways. First, they participate in increasing earnings and capital appreciation of their various businesses, and that enables them to increase cash dividends. Second, they're able to deploy that substantial free cash flow back towards supporting the growth of the three uh, uh, businesses, new strategic investments, and doing accretive share buybacks. Again, we'll look at that when we look at the letter from Bruce Flatt, but basically buying back shares when they think it's gonna be accretive or beneficial to the investor, not just buying back shares when they are at a super high price, which again can have a negative effect or not be really to the effect that was intended. So let's look at their specific businesses and see how they uh, measure up against these specific categories. So we're gonna be looking at how value is created for the asset management business. So Brookfield Asset Management is a global uh, leading alternative asset manager with over 850 billion of AUM or assets under management. So how do they create value in this business? They increase fee bearing capital or FBC. So again, increasing that base of capital, which they can then charge fees or gain revenue on in 
again, further, further increases their earnings potential. They want to maintain a cost discipline as they scale. So again, while you're growing this fee-bearing capital and revenue from this fee-bearing capital, you also want to make sure your costs are growing at a lower rate to ensure that margin is either expanding or staying relatively the same. You want to achieve strong investment returns and in turn, earn performance income like we talked about that carried interest. Now, they also want to increase cash income through organic levers. And like I said, with those dispositions, recycle underlying assets that they can make gains on. Now, what are the key performance metrics of this business? So it's DE, distributable earnings, that fee bearing capital on which they then generate fee related earnings. Now, the key performance metric here in terms of their performance and that extra income is that generated unrealized carried interest and realizing that carried interest. When they generate cash income or they get these dispositions from these assets they, that they, they then sell, they want to get distributions from those investments to the corporation and then disposition gains on those investments. So how is value measured? So the nice thing here, like I said, a lot of their businesses are publicly traded. So you can just look at the value in terms of the market price of BAM or Brookfield Asset Management as a multiple of those annualized fee-related earnings or FRE. And again, if you're looking at the other specific sectors, you can always do them as a multiple of generated carried interest here when your specific goal is generating that unrealized carried interest. Or in terms of evaluation, you can then look at how capital is deployed in terms of gains on dispositions. So let's look at the insurance business. So the ins insurance solutions business, Brookfield Reinsurance, BNRE, is a leading capital solutions business providing insurance and reinsurance services to individuals and institutions. So how is value created in this business? You, they're acquiring long duration, so long, long duration and predictable insurance liabilities. So why you want predictable insurance liabilities is you wanna be able to foresee where you're gonna to have to pay out specific insurance liabilities and write those policies very, very conservatively to then maintain that cash and hopefully not pay it out. So by proactively managing that risk of underwritten liabilities, just like I previously stated, they can then earn attractive risk adjusted returns on their investment portfolio in excess of the cost of managing those insurance liabilities. So what's the key performance metric here? It's the cost of those insurance liabilities, the earnings that they generate with the cash flow brought in, and then the distributable earnings for that specific insurance business. How is value measured? Again, multiple of DE here. Operating businesses. So these are those four global operating businesses. So we have Brookfield Renewable, BEP, Brookfield Infrastructure, BIP, Private Equity, BBU, and the Real Estate, BPG. So how do they create value in here? They increase cash flows and they recycle those assets and try to get a gain on disposition. So again, key performance metrics here, very similar to, I would say REITs, uh, but again, operating FFO or funds from operations and net operating income. And again, when you're recycling assets, distributions from those operating businesses, how was value measured? So like I said, three of these are actually public. So you have market prices of Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, Brookfield Renewable Partners and Brookfield Business Partners, and then the fair value under the Brookfield Property Group. All right, so capital allocation. So how do they find value in their capital allocation strategy? It's actually fairly simple and it's some of the best points I think of this presentation that I like to hear as an investor. So they're gonna increase cash dividends, have substantial share buybacks, support the growth of their three business types, new strategic investments, and pay out special dividends. So how do they uh, measure this or this key performance metric? disposition gains on any of those principal, principal investments, sorry, and contribution to growth in DE and DE per share or distributable earnings and distributable earnings per share. So that was the corporation going through each of those segments and kind of looking at how they define value, the different performance metrics that they measure themselves against and how the value is measured in terms of the investor's eyes. So let's now look at the quarterly earnings. So we have the distributable earnings here. And again, I'm gonna to try to break this down a little bit in detail because it is a little, I wouldn't say convoluted, but a little complicated. So distributable earnings before realization. So realizations mean any of those disposition gains that they get from selling those recycled assets or principal investments and any of that carried interest 
from managing those uh, investments or that share of the profits, if you will, from those specific investors. So this we're looking at this line, essentially your distributable earnings before any of this extra realizations. It was roughly 4.2 billion for the LTM or last 12 months or $2.61 per share, an increase of 11% over the last 12 months. I'm gonna show you how to get to that 11% in a bit. So basically this is the this current quarter, this is the previous year's quarter, and this is the last 12 months for each of the years, 2023 and 2022. Now this, again, if you're familiar with Brookfield or if you're not, they spun off uh, their Brookfield asset management business. As we saw, they still have the 75% stake in the Brookfield asset management business and 25% of that was spun off as its standalone business. So we're gonna be looking at comparatives, but basically right here, it's assuming that 100% of the business was included in these sections. So as we can see, Brookfield Asset Management actually had 634 million in terms of DE, and it's down from the previous year's quarter at 748. So it's a significant decline. But if you watched my uh, Brookfield Asset Management video where I went over their earnings, a lot of that was actually due to the Brookfield uh, Infrastructure Partners and the Brookfield Renewable Energy Partners. So they generate fees on these businesses based on the market cap or the stock price essentially of these businesses. So when the market cap and stock price uh, consequently go down, they generate less fees because they charge less fees on here just to keep their interests all aligned across their various business units, which I actually think is a great way of uh, charging these fees. Again, it keeps all of their businesses in line and performing alongside each other. So again, uh, that was the reason for that. So the asset management business in the last 12 months, 2.6 billion compared to roughly 3 billion. So it is down uh, year over year. The insurance solution business is ramping right along like expected 182 million compared to 159 million and 657 million for the last 12 months compared to 239 million. Now the Brookfield uh, renewables is up slightly 105 million compared to 100 million and 415 million compared to 395 million. Brookfield infrastructure partners 80 million compared to 75 million. The last 12 months, 350 million to 296. And again, Brookfield Business Partners again here, 36 million to 30 million. Now the property group, please do look at this. So as interest rates have risen, as expected, the property groups, distributable earnings have gone down from 191 million to roughly 179 million. For the last 12 months, they were 882 million compared to the 766 million now uh, currently. So they have gone down as interest rates go up that margin between that FFO or that distributable earnings and that interest expense does get compressed. As a result, they are less profitable. But if you've seen my past videos on Brookfield Corporation and their future plans, they're actually gonna be selling off a lot of this real estate that they consider to be not essential or not trophy real estate. They're just gonna keep the best of the best. So I would expect for this to continue for a little bit until they sell down that real estate, interest rates then shrink down, and then some of this can start becoming more and more profitable based on the number of properties again. So the actual contribution from the Brookfield Property Group, I think the contribution to distributable earnings is going to slowly decrease, but it's gonna be offset by large increases in the insurance solutions business and the asset management business. So when you look at it in terms of the quarter, it's roughly $1 billion uh, for DE, and then compared to $1.2 billion in the previous year, and then $4.1 billion of DE compared to $4.2 billion of DE over the last 12 months. So what I wanna focus on here, again, you'll see that it has this little one note. And when you scroll down, you can actually see why. So this right here considers if they actually did account historically, so here comparing apples to apples, uh, as opposed to comparing uh, you know, oranges to apples or whatever. So historically, here they've adjusted this to say, okay, you know what? If we actually take out the other you know, 25% of that Brookfield Asset Management business from the comparative, let's see what it would actually look like. So as you can see, for the last 12 months, that results in a roughly $4 billion dollars of, a, of adjusted DE compared to actually $3.7 billion of adjusted DE for 2022. So they're actually up. Whereas here, it looks like they're flat on a per share basis, $2.61 compared to $2.60. Here, it's $2.54 compared to $2.28. Now, when we take the difference here, 
$2.28. And then we minus that from the, or sorry, divide that from the factor of $2.28. We then see that's roughly almost 11% times it by the 100 factor. So it's roughly 11% increase there on a per share basis. And like we saw, that's roughly an increase of 11% there on a per share basis basis. So actually decent growth here on a per share basis in terms of distributable earnings when you're comparing apples to apples. All right, so now we've looked at their earnings. Let's go and look at their capital or what they call their assets. So they create value for their shareholders by increasing DE or distributable earnings generated by the capital as well as capital appreciation over time. Now their capital is roughly $136 billion on a blended basis as of September 30th, 2023. And this is what they use to earn those diversified long-term stable cash flows via dividends. Their capital generates roughly 4.6 billions of an annualized distributions with most of their earnings retained for reinvestment. So Brookfield Corporation, again, a lot of their cash flow, like they state, is for reinvestment. So they're focusing on growth here as opposed to paying them out in terms of dividends. So if you like that dividend strategy, Brookfield Asset Management is actually one that you would probably want to look at. Over the last 12 months, it generated unrealized carried interest of $1.4 billion, which is not included in the distributable earnings presented in the below table. So again, this is why I say a lot of people are forgetting about this uh, carried interest. It's going to be a significant growth factor and future cash flow in the future when they actually do recognize a lot of this. So this table here is a breakdown of their capital by their specific businesses. And they provide three methods for you to review. So they have quoted prices. So again, these are the market prices. They have the IFRS or the International Financial Reporting Standard Values and the blended values here being a combination of both. So they recommend that you focus on the blended values because it includes both the quoted and the quoted market prices and the IFRS prices. And since they have control over these uh, assets, they think that they can actually liquidate it for at least these values. So at least here being the minimum, and they can probably get a lot more for this, but they are going on the conservative side and quoting them at the least value. So here, as we can see, I'm going to be looking at the blended column, but this is that total $136 billion of capital here that they state. And we can see that Brookfield Asset Management compared to the prior year, so $40 billion here, or $40 million, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, $40 million, and uh, we're looking at that in terms of millions, so sorry there. So 40 there compared to the 26. And when you get down to the actual asset management business here, a nice $85 billion. So that is great there, in my opinion, $85 billion of capital compared to $79 billion in the previous year. Look at the insurance solutions, $11 billion compared to roughly $8 billion. The infrastructure partners, again, down a little bit to $6.1 billion compared to 6.5. Same with the renewables, 6.8 compared to 8 billion. You have the business partners, roughly 2.3 billion compared to 2.4 billion. The Brookfield property group here, so again, that is slightly in line with the previous year. All of those operating business, when you total them, roughly 39 or 40 billion compared to 42 billion here. So again, these operating businesses have been hit hard with a lot of raises in interest rates and in specific sectors. But again, their insurance solution business, great, great growth. Asset management business, great, great growth. And I think these two here are going to be a great tailwind in terms of future growth. So the total investments, like we saw, $136 billion in capital. Now, when you take out any of that debt or that preferred capital, that is actually recourse to the corporation, roughly $17 or $18 billion. It gives you a capital uh, per share or a capital per share of $73.68 or a NAV, net asset value. So that is the asset value less the debt and preferred capital then gives you your net asset value of $73.68. So when we compare that to the actual stock price, it's trading around $32.06. So in my opinion, it's still heavily, heavily undervalued compared to their own communicated net asset value. Again, it's like they're oper like the market is kind of putting zeros here in specific businesses. Like it's like they've written off the property group or or anything like that. These are still very, very valuable businesses. And I think that Brookfield Corporation is heavily undervalued. Now, when we go and look at that on a uh, chart here or a graph, we can see that the, the capital here, that 136 billion right here in 2023, 
what it's scaled to. It used to be 45 billion, then 51, 65, 68. It's at 136 billion now. So this is just huge, huge growth here in my opinion. And those annualized cash flows have followed as well from 1.7 billion all the way up to 4.6 billion. All right, so we looked at the capital there. Now we're going to be looking at Bruce Flatt's letter to shareholders. So the business has been strong. We've had another quarter of strong operating results. They continue to benefit from their leadership position in the alternative asset space, which has been experiencing strong growth. And they focus on the resiliency of cash flows generated by $140 billion of perpetual capital. Across the franchise, they're capturing increasing allocations from institutions, pension plans, sovereigns, and individuals towards real assets and private credit. So this point right here is super important. Over the past couple of decades, a lot of these pension plans, institutions, sovereign wealth funds, and even individuals have been allocating more and more capital to the alternative investment asset space. So there's a couple of reasons, but basically a lot of it has to do with reducing volatility and enhancing portfolio returns. So the alternative asset space, again, was a super small portion of the pie, but for a lot of these funds, it's growing to like one third of the total allocation now. It used to generally just be in equities and fixed income, and you have a small percentage in alternative assets, but more and more money is flowing into these alternative asset managers. And like I said, number one reason being reducing volatility, these assets are not traded on the public market, so they're less they're less subject to these this volatile time. Again, if you've been trading in the stock market, you know the prices of stocks go up and down, up and down, basically on the whim of a dime or any specific announcement. But these alternative assets do not work that way because they are in the private sector, so they are less volatile. Now, enhancing portfolio returns, a lot of these alternative investments have actually outperformed a lot of equities and fixed income over the past couple of decades so they can actually enhance or increase your portfolio returns and also because they're less liquid you are less likely to actually sell out of these positions and hold them for the long term so over time i expect that trend to continue a lot of money is going to continue to move to these alternative asset managers or these alternative assets so as that increasing allocation alternatives is growing in the retail and wealth distribution channels which today has raised approximately 800 million a month and show, should grow to roughly 1.5 billion a month in 2024. That is insane growth. So overall, their asset management business has raised 61 billion of capital to date this year, and their insurance solutions business is set to more than double that assets to over 100 billion in the coming months. And again, they have made a couple acquisitions here that AEL and Argo uh, acquisitions pushing them up to 100 billion in the coming months of those insurance assets. Now, this sets them up well for strong quarter or strong end of the year and step change up as they step change growth up into 2024. So again, those are some very, very key points here from that first paragraph that I wanted to share. So share repurchases. Now, we all know me as a dividend investor, I like dividends, but I also love share repurchases, especially in businesses that I want to hold for the long term, because when a business buys back a share and cancels it, you proportionally become a larger shareholder of that business. So overall, since the end of the last quarter, they continue to reinvest into their businesses, but also returned over $400 million to shareholders through regular dividends and share repurchases, taking total share buybacks over the last 12 months or LTM to approximately $750 million. So with the disconnect between the intrinsic value and trading price for both BN and their listed affiliates, and we're gonna be looking at the two that are popping up, they are continually allocating more capital opportunistically to buy back shares. So that's what I love to hear, allocating capital opportunistically and buying back shares when it's accretive or beneficial to us current shareholders, not buying them back at very or large or insanely high prices. It is worth noting they recently started repurchasing Brookfield Infrastructure Partners and Brookfield Renewable Shares in the open market in addition to the Brookfield uh, Business Unit, uh, Brookfield Business Partners Shares, sorry, also repurchased this year. All these repurchases are highly additive to the value or the net asset value of a, B, and share. So great, they're, they're seeing undervaluation in a lot of their companies and they're opportunistically buying back shares, which then helps increase the percentage ownership of BN of each of these companies, as well as buying them back and locking in uh, various distribution yields. 
So balance uh, sheet strength matters, 100% agree. Over many decades and through various cycles, they've developed a simple set of core principles with regards to financing their businesses. These principles still guide them today, and they are as follows. They always maintain significant and multiple sources of liquidity at the corporation. Again, being flush with capital when opportunities come. This is super important. Again, having the ability to have access to capital and then deploy that capital when opportunities arise themselves. That is how good investors become great investors. Finance investments using non-recourse asset level debt without cross collateralization. So again, we did speak to this before, but basically non-recourse or asset level debt, the level of debt. So let's take a property, for instance, is only recourse to that specific property, not to the corporation. So if anything happens to a specific property in terms of the mortgage or in terms of the debt, only that specific property is at risk. It cannot then uh, cross collateralize or be a contagion to the actual corporation. Now, they ensure their business and assets can be financed on that standalone basis, like we talked about here, but they act as a long-term owner and support those businesses to ensure they create long-term value. So that was the shareholder letter. Now, when I go and look at this in closing, I really like how Bruce Flatt says a lot of this. It's speaking like a true person, not not like a classic executive with a ton of different terms or other other things that maybe make it hard for investors to, to understand. He writes it in plain English. So in closing, he says he remains or their business remains committed to investing capital for you, the shareholder in high quality assets that earn solid cash returns on equity. So nice cash returns while emphasizing downside protection for that capital employed. The primary objective of the company continues to be generating increased cash flows on a per share basis. And as a result, the value per share or that intrinsic value per share should follow over the long term. So again, increased cash flows per share or per year equity ownership that's why we're investing. We're investing for clash, for cash flows, returns, and higher intrinsic values per share. So that was my video on Brookfield Corporation, uh, their most recent earnings, and then doing a brief overview. If you had any additional questions or comments, I encourage you to leave them in the comment section below. If you liked the video, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. So without further ado, I will see you in the next video. Thank you. Bye. Please note, I am not a financial advisor by any means. All of this information is merely for your entertainment purposes only. Please do your own due diligence when investing. Investing is inherently risky and you may lose money. Please contact a professional consultant when investing. And I am not liable for any investing decisions or any investing losses you make or incur. Thank you. Have a great day.